story time about how I came out as bi to my parents. Disclaimer, this is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. By the time I was 12 years old, I definitely knew I was bi. By the time I was 14, I'd already had a girlfriend and a boyfriend, but my parents did not know any of this. When I was 15, I even had a girlfriend for a full year. She would come around the house and I would say that she was my friend. But one day my mom walks in on me and my friend making out on the bed without our shirts on. My mom was so horrified that she actually ran out of the room. Later I explained to her that we were just playing a game and that it was popular at school. I basically convinced her that I was not bi. Or at least I thought I did. Later on that day my dad comes to my room and basically asked me if I liked girls. I swore up and down that I didn't. Then when I was 16 I found myself having two girlfriends, don't ask me how. Again, they would each come over and I would just say they were my friends. I thought I was home alone so I invited my girlfriend over. We start fooling around and that's when my door opens. My dad is looking at me getting it on with another girl. Part 2 is up. My dad walks in on me while I was fooling around with the girl in bed. Mind you, I'm a girl. Disclaimer, this is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. Keep in mind, I had half of my clothes on. My dad literally picked me up from the bed and threw me out of my room. Then he kicked my girlfriend out. It was definitely traumatizing. My dad called my mom and told her to rush home. They interrogated me for three hours. I told them I'd had girlfriends and boyfriends. They were more than shocked. They finally calmed down and I was able to go to sleep. Two days later, my dad tells me to pack my suitcase. I asked him why, but he wouldn't tell me. Then he drove me to a camp that promises to help your children who are bi. Instead of being afraid, I told my dad that I would try my best. I lasted about two days there. They basically made us do Bible study, and I was made to feel like a perv. So I packed my little suitcase, and I left. So of course, I packed my suitcase, climbed two walls, and I was free. That's when I heard a really scary alarm. Part three is up. I thought I was free, but then I hear an alarm sound. That's when I heard footsteps behind me. I started running and I got to a main road. Luckily, a bus was pulling up right on time. I get on the bus and I go straight to my girlfriend's house, which was about two hours away. That means they would have already told my parents I had escaped. Well, when I get to my girlfriend's house, my parents are already there. But guess what? My parents weren't there to pick me up. They were there to drop off all of my things. Yep, that's right. They kicked me out of the house. Thankfully, my girlfriend's family were super cool and they let me live with them. When I turned 18, I got an apartment and a roommate. My entire family stopped talking to me. It's been four years since I last saw my parents. I recently got hired at my dream job. So I went to my parents' house and I told them. I also came out to them properly. At least this time I was not yelled at. I speak to my mom on the phone every now and then, but I feel like I should talk to my dad again. What do you guys think? I just want them to accept me. One of the most terrifying cults that I have learned about recently refers to themselves as the children. And the reason that they terrify me so much is because they are related to so many other cults. Well, Scientology came about in 1953. And two members from this church, Robert D. Grimson and Marianne McLean, decided to leave it and start the cult of the Process Church of the Final Judgment. And they brought their satanic teachings to the U.S. around the 1970s. Well, if you guys watched my previous video about the Son of Sam killings, which occurred in New York City around the 1970s, you might be able to connect these two things together. Well, the issue with this case is that one man was convicted. But it seems as though police really fudged this up. There was so much attention around this case that they were just looking to just put someone behind bars instead of actually doing full investigations. Well, one editor named Maury Terry ended up taking investigating into his own hands. And not only was he able to find a substantial amount of evidence and cryptic messages, but he was also able to find where the cult would meet up for their rituals, Devil's Cave. Part two to why I don't think the son of Sam worked alone. Well, it was rumored that there was a cult working in New York City that was an offshoot of the Process Church of the Final Judgment. They referred to themselves as the children and ended up in Yonkers. Well, when Maury was doing his investigating, he was let known by several people that their rituals were done in Untermeyer Park, an estate that used to be absolutely beautiful. But as you can see from the pictures, there's now an abandoned pump house. And when investigating this, trigger warning, they found blood on the walls and blood on the ceiling in symbolic writing. Not only this, but dead animals were everywhere, including specifically dogs. So then it was time to look back at David's letters in which he made cultural references to Beelzebub which is the demon known as Lord of the Flies, and Brat, which is a small devil. He also ended his letter as From the Gutters, which was quite literally the nickname for the abandoned pump house. And when holding how he signed his name at the end of the letters to the mirror, you can find the words Sam and Carr and Burke in it. So where were the actual sons of Sam and why hadn't they been questioned? The modes, if you're in any, anywhere in here and you want to shut them off, just push and hold. Shut off. But they're pretty cool. I highly recommend them. Part 
three to why I don't think the son of Sam worked alone. Well, after Maury had taken an investigation into his own hand and was seeing all these connections, he went to the police with it. And he was essentially just told to shut it down. That they had their man behind bars, there's no way other people worked with him. Even though there was clear indications that he was working with a cult. And none of the eyewitness sketches even looked like him. So the last thing to do would be able to tie the Sons of Sam to the actual case. So John, Michael, and Wheat Carr were all the kids of Sam. Michael and John specifically being the sons. After talking to neighbors, there were several stories about Sam beating them. Their father Sam struggled with alcoholism, and this was all included in the letter that David wrote. So Maury's like, okay, let's go do investigating in the place that they were from. My not North Dakota. And when they got to their hometown, they were told by everyone that they were legitimately cult leaders. There was accounts of them sacrificing dogs, drinking blood, all the work. So Maury was like, okay, we need to actually get a hold of these guys. Maybe they'll be open to talking about it, but soon after that, it was reported that they both mysteriously died. Part 4 to why I don't think the son of Sam worked alone. So how did the other suspects mysteriously die, you might be asking? Well, one randomly unalived himself, while the other died in a mysterious car crash, which is entirely suspicious. So after adding all of this evidence together, they were able to release it to the public, and it made sense that Berkowitz would have had other people watching, other people holding the gun, other people doing the killings, all orchestrated by a cult leader. But because their main suspects for this case were now dead, there wasn't really much that they could do. Maury was trying to prevent this from happening again, though. Like, what if the children decide to send another member of theirs out? Either way, their parent cult, the Process Church of the Final Judgment, was neighbors to Charles Manson, and is where he got many of his own foundational ideas for his cult. So it's so clear that these connections run deep. Let me know what you guys think of this case. Let me know if there's anything in this that you want me to talk about next, like Scientology or Charles Manson, or if you want to hear more about the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Either way, follow my Instagram for more content. Once there was a girl named Jenny. She was like all the other girls, except for one thing. She always wore a green ribbon around her neck. There was a boy named Alfred in her class. Alfred liked Jenny, and Jenny liked Alfred. One day he asked her, why do you wear that ribbon all the time? I cannot tell you, said Jenny. But Alfred kept asking, why do you wear it? And Jenny would say, it's not important. Jenny and Alfred grew up and fell in love. One day they got married. After their wedding, Alfred said, now that we're married, you must tell me why you have that green ribbon. You must wait, said Jenny. I will tell you when the right time comes. Years passed. Alfred and Jenny grew old. One day, Jenny became very sick. The doctor told her that she was dying. Jenny called Alfred to her side and said, now I can tell you about the green ribbon. She told him to untie it so he could see why. And Jenny's head fell off.